Hey everybody, this is Jim Grisanzio. We are back here in Taipei, and I'm here with David Buck, a JVM engineer from the Java Platform Group. David, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Good, I'm glad you're here, David. And actually, I've been trying to get an interview with David for about a year now, various conferences that we go to, um, because I want to talk about Java and about what you do. Uh, but first, before we get into some of the other things, I want to talk about the tour a little bit. You've been on a couple of cities. We were in Japan together in you know, Tokyo a couple of days ago. And now we're here in Taipei. So that's you know, two sessions that you've done. And so you're going to do the wrap-up session here upstairs in about an hour or so. Actually, about a half hour. <laughs> so we've got to get finished here. Uh, so what are you talking about? So I'm talking about the Java memory model, which is one of those things that you know, most Java programmers are aware of but they might not necessarily know all the details. And some of those details can actually be kind of scary and come back to bite you if you're not paying attention to them. So the Java memory model itself is actually kind of a really complex and, and large topic. And there's no way you could cover it in like a single you know, 45 minute session. But the idea is to kind of, you know, kind of give people a wake up call and say, hey, you know, if you're not paying attention to some of these details, they can come back to bite you. And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to just make, get people a little more aware of, of what some of the nooks and crannies of the specification are so that they don't fall into some of those potholes. So, um, is this an obscure topic in Java development? Um, a little bit. I mean, it, one of the reasons that most people don't know much about it is because very often they don't have to or they at least believe they don't have to. And that's because usually the hardware and, and sometimes the platforms that we're running on top of kind of allow us, they're, they're more forgiving than the specification actually requires. So a good example of that is if you're doing your development work on, regular, on a regular Intel CPU, an x86 or AMD64, or something like that, and then you take that same code and you move it to a less forgiving platform like ARM, all of a sudden your code that was working perfectly on your desktop machine or your laptop is throwing up all sorts of strange race conditions and bugs when you're running it on an ARM. And that's because in, in both cases, it's the same code. You were kind of ignoring certain parts of the memory model, but the Intel platform was forgiving, where the ARM platform was much less forgiving for those kind of mistakes. So the idea is to kind of let, of this session is to kind of show people some examples of here's some things that you can get into trouble with if you're not aware of the memory model. Seems, seems very technical. You can get through this in 45 minutes? I haven't so far, but you know, maybe I think this is my sixth or seventh time trying to deliver this specific content, and I always seem to run out of time, but... Um, it's actually a big deal. It's actually a good point because you know these sessions are technical. These are not marketing talks. These are not. These are not you know slideware. You know, I mean, I'm sitting through these things, and they go into quite detail. You know, and so I know you travel every now and then. I can see you at various conferences, and you're doing highly, highly technical talks. And I oftentimes wonder how you get it all in. You know, in just you know 45 minutes or so. It's it, you definitely have to compromise. You have to take everything you want to say about a topic and then start trying to whittle it down. You know, based off of what's important to, to communicate. Um, you know, certainly if, if you had you know maybe an hour or even two hours or you know some of these topics you could easily talk about for a whole day, um, and, and we just don't have that time. So the, these topics aren't really meant to teach so much as to point people into the right direction of you know hey if you need need to learn more about this and you know if you've decided that from listening to the content today then here's what here's the books you should read or here's the web pages you should look at or here's you know here's where you can go on and kind of do more research on your own to learn about this topic so being a JVM engineer um, is this a topic that you talk about regularly or do you have like a range of things that you talk about in your in your uh, in your in your uh, in your speeches well most of my my talks are somehow involved in my day job meaning that like if my, my I'm a sustaining engineer so most of my time is spent fixing bugs in hotspot and so very often if I'm coming across some, some issue where I'm working with another team or working with with a customer outside of Oracle for example and I see oh you know they, they have trouble understanding some topic or something that seems like a good signal to me that maybe this would be good content for a future talk so a lot of my talks are somehow that they're they're offshoots of you know things that I came across or problems or kind of low-hanging fruit of hey a lot of people would really be interested in hearing about this or, or things like that so and actually you just triggered me because um, you and I first met over a bug I remember you pinged me 
about it was a Solaris bug or a Java bug on Solaris or something because I was still on the Open Solaris project at that point. Maybe it was just it was just near right after. Yes, remember I remember that bug. It, it turned out not to be a bug, right? I, I I was the bug filer and I was like Solaris is definitely wrong here. And then of course Solaris was not wrong at all. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, no, it, that was um, that was with the um, software on silicon. Um, you know, colored pointers implementation, and we were just starting to use it and kind of get an idea of what it could do. And it, I, I kind of fell into the exact same scenario that the Solaris guys subscribe, um, described a bunch of times where, you know, this tool will go out and help you find issues with your code, problems where you're misusing pointers. And the first reaction everyone has when it finds a problem is they go, oh, the tool's wrong. My code's not broken. And so, of course, use the tool and it says that, hey, your code's broken. I look at that and go, that's not broken. This tool must be wrong. And so filed a bug report. And of course, our code was wrong. So, um, you know, it, the tool did exactly what it was supposed to do. It helped us find issues that were very, very d difficult to identify and understand just from a cursory reading through the source code. Um, so it was an amazing tool and, and technology and it was really cool that it worked the way it did. It was really interesting because I was in Osaka and you were in Tokyo and I knew of you because we have some mutual friends up in up in you know, Tokyo and you just you know came to me looking for a contact or something in Solaris and that's how we met actually and uh, note the open Solaris shirt here um, and that's actually what I wanted to talk to you about is um, I've been in Japan for a while I used to be the community manager on the open Solaris project and you know we big and we did a lot of community building in Japan with with you know Solaris engineers and you know Solaris, you know essentially operating system developers, and at the time I didn't know a lot of the Java developers, but now in this new job, I'm getting to meet them. And one of the things I noticed about the Solaris engineers in Japan is they were very talented. There's a lot of skill there. And I'm just wondering what your observations are working in Japan with the Java community, because my initial read is that there's a significant amount of talent in Japan in Java. Oh, without an, any doubt, um, the the Java community here is just amazing. Uh, every time they do one of their their uh, twice a year CCC events, for example, um, you know where they they host these huge conferences with you know over a thousand participants. You know the the level of, of quality, the content that everyone brings to all their talks, the the participation from the audience. I mean, it, it's really just amazing it's so impressive and interacting with everybody individually um, you know the, the Java champions the jug the jug leaders and, and all the members I mean they're just so motivated and their skill level is so high to, to begin with it's almost intimidating at first to, to work with them because it's like man these people really 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 know their stuff um, and it's interesting so sometimes if you're not familiar presenting in Japan you might actually present in front of a group and then might not be a lot of questions if it's in like a, you know traditional setting and some pe and times people ask me oh you know did they understand it and I said oh I can assure you they understood you you know because it's just you know sometimes it takes you know you have to break some formality to get more conversation going but the talent is really really serious there yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it can be very non-interactive feeling, um, and sometimes I found that it, it, it's worth it to try and maybe push people a little bit more, you know, to try and get them out of their comfort zone and and to speak up and to, you know, in, be more involved in, in group discussions and, and things like that. But but certainly, yeah. I mean, it's from the beginning of time, basically, you know, in Japan, I think it's been an, it's been difficult for people to kind of be the first to speak, whether that be ask a question or point out something or whatever. I think that's changing, but, but there's definitely a, a cultural um, you know, aspect there where, where uh, people are hesitant to kind of stand out. And that's a shame because, I mean, there's so many amazingly high-skilled engineers here that really should be standing out you know, on, on the global stage because they have so much to contribute to the, the entire global Java community um, because they're so good at what they do. So. Um, yeah, anything we can do to kind of get more of these these amazing engineers, you know, out on the world stage and get people to pay attention to them, I think is going to be better for all of us. In fact, actually, this year, I think we had a couple of new, a couple of new, a couple of new um, groundbreaker ambassadors and Java champions from uh, Tokyo, as well. Cool. So, what's next for you? Where do you go from here? I know that there's an event in Osaka in in November, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So later this month, we've got another thing. I don't, I don't know if it's a Groundbreakers event or a Jug event. or there, there's, there's I think it's a Jug event, but there's some Groundbreakers there. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, we're, we're all good friends, right? Um, so, yeah, there, there's, so there's something coming up in a few weeks in, in Osaka. And then there, there's a few things. There's something, I think, in de December as well, maybe. But I, I don't know. But yeah, in, in January, we're talking about adding a few dates. Um, for uh, in Osaka again, I think there's there's going to be a. Well, I'll definitely be there um, in a few weeks in Osaka, so I think you're coming down and a few other guys that I know as well. So maybe we'll you know have some you know some additional conversations there. It's really loud here in the street, but I can show you Mike. There's nothing in there. It's just mostly just on the microphone here. So anyway, David, thank you very much for coming by. Thank you. Appreciate it, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.